is John chapter 10. Miss Catherine, I was just thinking as we were singing about standing on the promises. Brother Grady said, uh, great Christian character in you. Great character. He knows what you're dealing with is might. And, uh, and he says it takes a lot of character to continue on to the Lord alone. So he, uh, I wanted to make sure you knew that as well. So. All right, uh, John chapter 10. John chapter 10. And then also 1 Corinthians 14. John 10 and 1 Corinthians 14. Now, I did reach out to Bill and say, next year, here's the dates I'm thinking about, but he didn't respond. <laughs> so I don't know if that means he's through with us and we're through with him. But um, if we do have a meeting next year, I do want to have what I've called Bible Baptist Jubilee. That's, that's the name I'm going to go with. Um, if we do have it next year, be around the same time, maybe the last week, beginning week of, uh, beginning, end of September, beginning of October. And uh, if we don't have Bill in, we'll have somebody else um, of, the, of the like. And, uh, but I'll let you know as that takes place. All right, let's read John chapter 10 first of all. Then we'll go to 1 Corinthians 14. It'll be verse 10 in 1 Corinthians 14. But John chapter 10, verse 1, I was blessed that Brother Grady preached out of a couple of references, verses, chapters, books that uh, we have been preaching out of. He referenced John 10. He, re he preached Thursday night out of Psalm 139, which I've been preaching out of on Wednesday nights about being fearfully and wonderfully made, how we're made of gold dust, amen. And, uh, but John chapter 10, verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Yes. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Mm -hmm. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. Mm -hmm. And he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. I'll pause for a second. It's, you know, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, driving him down to the airport. And before he fell asleep, I said, Brother Green, i got a question for you. I said, I'm preaching out of John 10. And uh, I gave him an outline that um, is what I'm going to preach to you. But when I said to him, uh, I'm going to be preaching out of John 10. I was going to give him the outline that I had prepared to preach. But the outline that came out of my mouth just came out extemporaneously as we're driving. I don't know why I didn't give him the outline I had prepared, but rather made up an outline as we're driving. And then I thought, man, that's good. <laughs> so at four in the morning when I got home, I put it all down. And that's what I'm preaching to you. So if it doesn't make sense, it's only because at 2.30 in the morning it made sense to me. <laughs> It's okay. But I said to him, you know, again, preachers are trying to pick the preacher's brain. And I had so many things left on the table because I just didn't get as much time with him as I had, as I had thought I thought I would. I didn't get any time with him Tuesday or Wednesday. But uh, I said, Brother Grady, I said, who do you think the porter is? Who's the porter? And uh, he's like, I don't know. <laughs> Great. So I can't preach on the porter because I don't know who the porter is. So I'm going to study out to see if I can find out who this porter character is. But uh, there's a porter in the text. I, I have in Sunday school a thought came to me, and I don't know if it's a right thought or not. But if we get to who the porter is, maybe I'll preach or teach out of it. But to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. And he called his own sheep by name and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Mm -hmm. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of the strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were, which he spake unto them. The sermon I was going to preach was about the sheep, the shepherd, and the stranger. That might be next week, the sheep, the shepherd, and the stranger. But instead, I want to preach on three distinct voices. Three distinct voices. You'll find that there are three distinct voices in the cha in the chapter. There's the sheep's voice, the shepherd's voice, and the stranger's voice. So I'm still kind of preaching a similar thing. The voice of the sheep, the voice of the stranger, and the voice of the shepherd. I want to preach on those three voices, distinct voices this morning. But go over to, hold your finger in John. Go over to uh, 1 Corinthians 14. I think there's a lot of material in these six verses. <coughs> We'll preach about three distinct voices, the, the voice of the sheep, the voice of the shepherd, and the voice of the stranger. But 1 Corinthians 14 verse 10 was a verse that came to mind as the outline was coming to mind and trying to flesh it out. 
1 Corinthians 14, 10, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. There's three distinct voices in the chapter, John chapter 10, the voice of the sheep, the voice of the shepherd, and the voice of the, sh and the stranger. But there are so many kinds of voices in the world, and every voice has a distinct characteristic to it. They're, they're all not without uh, uh, signification. Every voice is significant. Amen. Yeah. Uh, in politics, they want to talk about let your voice be heard because they're significant. That's true. Yeah. You know, uh, every voice matters. Every voice is significant. Some voices may be not as significant as others, maybe because they're not as loud as others. Uh, some voices don't get the preeminence because they're young voices. Right? Children should not, the children's voice should not overrule the voice of a parent. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Children obey your parents. The voice of children should not disobey the voice of the parents, right? But every voice has signification. Of course, the Lord said, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not. The Lord liked to hear the voices of children. In church, the voices of children represent life. Amen? So voices are, are significant, but there are three distinct voices. Go back to John chapter 10. We need to be aware of in the chapter. And because there are so many voices in the world, Christians need to discern which one they hear. And in John 10, there are three distinct voices to observe. Now, these three voices are the primary voices we are to discern when rightly dividing the Bible by asking a very key question. Whose voice do I hear? Whose voice is doing the speaking? That's a very key question when rightly dividing your Bible. We were talking about that before Sunday school. A key question is, whose voice do I hear? Who is speaking and who is the voice speaking to is the second follow-up question to that. But there are three distinct voices and these three voices are found all throughout the Bible. They are the main three voices in the Bible. They are God's voice, man's voice, and the devil's voice. Now under the subheading, the subconstruct of man's voice, there is the voice of animals. Now, Ms. Val's not here this morning. Her, she had to put down um, um, Sadie yesterday. But Miss Val would tell you that her dog spake. Now, I don't think it's the son of Sam type business. I was there when, when I heard Sadie yeah. speak to Alex, and Dad has heard it. And it is like training a parrot how to speak. A parakeet, whatever it is. You can hear something coming out, and that's something within the vocals. I don't understand it. But in the Bible, a ass did speak. Yeah. Balaam's donkey did speak with the voice of a man. In the garden, you have something that resembles the devil, possibly a snake, speaking. My son, Micah, there said, Dad, is it possible that Balaam was not shocked when the donkey spake? Because before the fall, in the garden, all animals spake. How many of you ever thought of that before? She's thought of that. There you go, Mike. You got somebody to go with you. Very possible that it's not surprising that animals spake in the garden before the fall because after the fall, you do find an animal speaking and he wasn't surprised any more than it was surprising that a virgin could conceive and bring forth a child. Why? Maybe Eve did it. Who knows? So under that that structure of man, you do have animals that can speak. Now, within the construct of God, you have the angelic realm. Mm -hmm. Cherubim and seraphim and the angels. And they all angels are represented by man, yeah. right? A an angel is a man. There's no female angels, ladies. All angels in heaven, the Bible, are said to be men. Yeah. And they speak. But that's the, So that's God's realm. Man's realm, we got the animals to speak and not very many. In God's realm, the angels speak, the angelic realm. And of course, in devils, in the devil's realm, he has his spirits that speak. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah. All three of those, devil, uh, uh, dogs, animals, angels, and unclean or fallen angels, they're all got spirits. And the Bible says to try the spirits. Mm -hmm. When you're listening to spirits, they all have voices. So when I say try the spirits, I'm also saying try the voices. Yeah. 
you need to discern as Christians whose voice is it that I hear. Again, you have the son of Sam who thought he was hearing the voice of a dog. But it was probably the voice of an unclean spirit in that dog. Amen. Is that right? Amen. And so you have to be very mindful, very cautious about whose voice do I hear. And all of these voices, human voice, God's voice, devil's voice, spirit's voice, animal's voice, they all show up in the Bible. Okay? But the three main ones, of course, are God, man, and the devil. So the first voice I want us to look at is the voice of the sheep. That's you. Um, he says there, he says, um, uh, let me see. Uh, to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls them out by name and leadeth them out. When, when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Now here's the question. How would the shepherd know where the sheep were? Unless the shepherd... Then we put the sheep there, but he knows they stay there because what? He hears their voice. So sheep have a voice. Now, I don't think y'all have sheep, Brother Scott, Sister Krista, but y'all got goats. Y'all know there's goats still in there. No one's taking them because you still hear the goats. Is that right? Or the horse in the barn or the chickens in the pen. You know you still have the animals because the animals are still making noises. So you know you have to go and let them out or feed them because they're barking or they're quacking or they're neighing or they're whatever in, you know that you have some animals to take care of. How does the shepherd know to take care of the sheep and the sheep have needs and the sheep are still there and he still has sheep to take care of because the sheep have a voice. Amen. That's you. Amen. Now in the Old Testament, to be doctrinal for a second, Israel is the sheep with the flock of God. Yep. Psalm 95 verse 7, For he is our God and we are the sheep of his pasture. Uh, Psalm 100 verse 3 Know ye that the Lord he is God It is he that made us and not we ourselves We are his people and the sheep of his pasture So Israel were the people and the sheep of God's pasture That's Old Testament, right? That's the nation of Israel They are called his sheep And Jerusalem were the pasture he put them in Israel and the twelve tribes of Israel when they got their inheritance, that was their lamb. That was their pasture. Amen? And he was supposed to be their shepherd. God in heaven, in the millennium, the sheep will be back in their pasture with the shepherd on the throne taking care of the sheep. In the New Testament, we don't replace Israel in that Israel is no longer part of the prophetical plan of God, prophecy of God. Israel still uh, lives and is part of God's prophecy and God's plan alongside the church, but Israel is on the back burner as it concerns present day uh, construct within the church age. In other words, you right now are called the bride of Christ, or you right now are what are God's sheep as the church. Israel is outside of that pasture, still grazing in their own national pasture, Israel. Yeah. They're still over there right now getting bombed daily. I get updates, at least six or seven updates like every hour about what's going on over there. They got Turkey. They got Syria. They got Jordan. They got Iran. They got Lebanon. They got Hamas. They got Hezbollah. They got, uh, they got Russia. They got China. They even have the U.S. of A. who is telling them to sign a treaty, giving them weapons over here. But oh, by the way, we also supplied Iran with all those nuclear bombs. You see, you got to keep the war machine going. So you give the enemy the weapons, and then you also fund Israel with the weapons so they can blow each other up, and then you get to sit back and say, let's broker a peace deal. Yeah. Oh boy. Make it look good. As Netanyahu said, we've signed 1,751 peace treaties with Lebanon. They haven't kept one yet. Why don't we sign another one? Yeah. I'll tell you why, because it's political expediency. That's why. Yep. Yep. It's a voting year. That's what you got going on. But anyways... Israel is very close to being, the church is fixing to leave, so God's going to take his sheep out of our pasture yeah, yeah. here on earth, and he's going to bring his fold, his sheep, back into the pasture of Israel, yeah. the land of Israel, to be governed by a stranger, yeah. 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 a hireling, a wolf. Yeah. And they're going to be like, wait a second. He says, when you see that abomination of desolation set up, what do you do? You run. Why? Because that ain't your shepherd. Right, right. That's a stranger in the land. Right. 
Amen. And uh, he's going to be of a Gentile nature because Gentiles in the Bible are called strangers. So anyways, um, right now, you as Christians, you as the church, if you're saved, you are the flock of God and you are the sheep of his pasture. Romans 8.36 As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We, Paul is acute, uh, 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 associating himself both as a national Jew but also as a spiritual uh, Jew in the uh, church, the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. He's saying we are accounted as sheep of the slaughter. Who is he saying that to? That's Romans 8.36. Who's he addressing in, in Romans 8.36? He's addressing Rome. He's addressing Romans. He's saying, hey, a, a Christian Romans and those that are in the Roman church are writing to, we are the sheep. We are the flock. Showing you that God is not just dealing with Israel only throughout Romans, as someone like to say in Romans chapter 10, but God is dealing with both Jew and Gentile in the church, and he's writing to a Gentile church in Rome saying, we all are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Amen. That's got nothing to do with the Vatican. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now here's the great truth. God hears the voice of the old sheep mm -hmm. and the voice of the young sheep. Amen. Over there is the voice of the young sheep and some in here. But we also have the voice of the old sheep in here. Mm -hmm. Amen. And God hears both the old and the young. God hears the sheep uh, uh, that are rich and poor. Amen. Uh, God hears the sheep of both male and female. Ain't that a wild thought? That when you have a farm, uh, you don't just, it's not just the rich ones that make noise. It's the weaker ones that make noise as well. It's not just the black ones, but it's the black ones and the white ones. Amen. They all have a voice and they're all significant. They all have a purpose and they all fall within the shepherd's plan as it pertains to his flock, his field, his pasture, his pen. And that's true for you and I. Every one of you are significant and your voice matters to God and it matters in this church. Amen. God, of course, has given me your pastor as an under shepherd, a lowly uh, a shepherd, as it were, to take care of his sheep. And I have to be accountable for how I take care of his sheep. And so they're all significant. The pastor does not cater to the rich ones and forget the poor ones. He don't just minister to the men and not the women. He don't just minister to the old and not the young. He's a shepherd all because they all are part of God's plan and God's purpose as the local church is constructed. Amen. The local church is a microcosm and the body of Christ is the macro. Micro, local church, low level, we're all just low level shepherd and sheep. But on a much larger scale, God has many shepherds and many sheep scattered over many places on the earth for the last 2,000 years. Yeah, amen. And God has not missed a one of them at any time. Yeah, amen. He hears every single amen. voice. Can I show you a great truth about this? Look at Genesis 21. Genesis 21. Maybe hold John 10, but Genesis 21. Look at verse 17. Genesis 21, 17. Genesis 21, 17. And God heard the voice of the lad. This is Ishmael. This is not even a, this is not a Jew. This is not the promised seed. This is a child born out of a uh, out of a uh, relationship not ordained of God, right? Between Abraham and Hagar. It says, And God heard the voice of the lad Ishmael, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. Hey, listen, there's not a voice in this world. It's a young man, probably between 13 to 21 years old, a young lad here who is a castaway, a stranger from the commonwealth of Israel, and God hears his voice. Can I just say before you got saved, that's what you were. You are a stranger, a foreigner from the commonwealth of Israel on the outside looking in. But if you'll come to Christ believing you don't deserve anything but a broke back in hell this morning, then you recognize that the time that your voice called out to God and he heard your voice and he saved you. Amen. 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 You know, God blessed Ishmael 
and God blessed Ishmael's uh, tribes and nations. He made them prosper. They're still over there fighting Israel today. Why? Because all of, because God heard one man's voice crying out, and God blessed that voice in spite of the way he came into the world. Can I just say this? The way he came into the world is no excuse for how you use your voice. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Amen. Just because you were born into a uh, into a terrible relationship with your mother or father because you were abandoned or or thought to be given up does not give you the excuse or the right or the privilege, especially as a Christian, to have a rebellious voice against Amen. God. You can't keep living the victim mentality Amen. life up. Right. Well, you don't know how I was raised. You don't know my parents abandoned me. You don't realize I grew up in a, in a drug-infested home. I, I grew up on the streets. Yeah, but you're a child of God. That's what you were, but that's not what you are. You're part of his flock. You're part of his pasture. Use your voice for good and use your voice to get other voices like yours to hear God's voice. Amen. Quit living with a victim mental mentality and live with a victorious mentality. Amen. Amen. That that's not who you are, who you were. That's not who you are, but that's who you were. I uh, thank God that he hears our voice. Look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15. 1 Samuel 15. That's the voice of the sheep. Amen. He hears our voice. Say, what does it sound like? 1 Samuel 15. What do we sound like in God's ears? Amen. What do we sound like in God's ears? Yeah. 1 Samuel 15. Look at verse 14. 1 Samuel 15, 14. And Samuel, he'll represent God here. And Samuel said, What meaneth? Then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear. You know, that's what you sound like in God's ears. That's your voice, your sheep. When God hears your voice, he hears, bah, bah. that's what he hears. But he also hears the lowing of oxen. I think the bleeding of sheep might sound more like murmuring and complaining. He still hears that. But what's the lowing of the oxen? Look at 1 Samuel chapter 6. And ladies, you'll specifically understand this. But man, I think even you would agree this is what you hear at times or how you sound at times. 1 Samuel 6 and look at verse 10. This is the return of the Ark of the Covenant back to Israel. It, the Philistines having had it, I think 20 years or so. 1 Samuel 6 verse 10. And the men did so in two, and took two milk kine and tied them to the cart now these are two mother mother oxen what these are two mother kind and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves that's their babies at home these are two mothers that are being taken away from their children and they laid the ark of the coven uh, the ark of the lord upon the cart and the coffer with the mice of gold and the images of their emeralds and the kind took the straight way that's the right way to go, ladies. Amen. Men, to the way of Beth Shemesh and went along the highway. Look at lowing as they went and turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them under the border of Beth Shemesh. You know what the lowing of the oxen is? That's that low, drawn out, mournful sound. Those two mother, mother kind there that were being used as a sacrifice that's what happens in these milk kind if you read on in the chapter uh when he gets back to israel these mothers are sacrificed as an offering to god and mothers when it comes to these their children that's what it sounds like a mother to lose a child as you heard about thursday night uh, a mother to have the children taken away from her for her to be taken away from her children for one reason or another that might be what it sounds like the lowing of the oxen that mournful sound you know that's what it sounds like anytime you're sorrowful Anytime you're going through storms, anytime you're going through trouble, uh, you you sound lowing, you sound sad, you sound mournful. And you know, God hears that voice. Samuel said, what's the voice of the bleeding of the sheep or the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Uh, that's the sound of complaining, but that's also the sign, the sound of those who are in trouble, the sound of those who need comfort, the sound of those who are in distress, those who are in grief. Those who have lost children, those who have lost husbands, those who have lost wives or lost friends and family members, those that have lost their jobs, those that are in despair. That's the voice that God hears. He hears your voice. Amen. 
And yet, it's our responsibility to just keep moving forward. Yes, just keep moving forward. Yes. So my kids don't talk to me anymore. What do I do? Just keep moving yes, forward. Yes, yes. And just pray for them all the way along the way. Yes. And you know what? God might take your life, ladies, husbands, to reach your children. I think moms especially, if God had to take your life to get one of your children saved, to get them back in church and get right with God, you'd say, I'd be willing to, I'd be willing to make that that exchange. Amen. Christ did for us, did he not? Amen. Can I just read you some verses real quick about God hearing our voice? I had a whole bunch, but I won't read them to you for sake of time. Psalm 13, verse 2. Lord, hear my voice. Let thy ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. Psalm 3, verse 4. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Say law. Psalm 5, verse 3. My voice shalt thou hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning will I direct my prayer unto thee and will look up. Psalm 18, verse 6. In my distress, I called upon the Lord and cried unto my God. He heard my voice out of his temple and my cry came before him, even to his ears. That's the lowing of the oxen. Hear, O Lord, when I cry. Psalm 27, verse 7. Hear, O Lord, my cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. Psalm 55, 17, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. See the confidence in that? Yep. He will hear my voice. Yeah, he How do you know? Because I'm his sheep. I'm of his pastor. He knows. He hears my voice. Psalm 64, 1. This is a psalm of David. Hear my voice, O God, in my prayer. Preserve my life from fear of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Psalm 77, 1. A psalm of Asaph. I cried unto God with my voice. Even unto God with my voice, and he gave ear unto me. Psalm 81, 11, But my people would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would not of me. That's Jeremiah pleading on the behalf of Israel. And he says, They would not hearken to my voice. That's the voice of the preacher. I'm warning you, don't go. Don't leave the good pasture. Don't leave the green fields. Hey, I'm warning you, don't follow the stranger. I'm warning you, there's danger out there. But Lord, they won't hear my voice. You know what I know? One day... He'll hear their voice. Yeah. Yeah. Now here's one I like. Psalm 116, verse 1. Now in Hebrew, you read right to left. Yes. So yeah. Psalm 116, verse 1 is Psalm 1611. Yeah. Yeah. Backwards. I love the Lord Amen. because He hath heard my voice Amen. and my supplications. Amen. You know why you love the Lord? Because He's a good shepherd. Yeah. He's a great shepherd. He's a chief shepherd. Yeah. He always hears your voice, whether you're the lad whether you're the cast off, whether you're the lowing of the sheep or the lowing of the ox or the bleeding of the sheep, he will always hear mm -hmm. your voice. Whether you're in a foxhole or a hellhole like Jonah, Jonah said uh, in, in the belly of hell, I lift up my voice and cried. Whether you're in the foxhole or the hellhole, mm -hmm. God will hear your voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go to John chapter 10 unless you're still there. Secondly is the voice of the shepherd. That's your savior. Yeah. The voice of the sheep is you. The voice of the shepherd is your Savior. Amen. Look at uh, verse 3. He says, uh, see verse 2, it's the shepherd of the sheep. He goes in because he knows where the sheep are. Verse 3, to him the porter openeth. So the porter opens. Whoever that porter is, the porter responds to the voice of the shepherd. But he also responds to the voice of the sheep. That's why he's there. And so the voice of the shepherd causes the door to be open. All right? And he called his own sheep by name. Hey, isn't that a blessing? He, he knows your name. Yes, yes. As a shepherd, as the master of your animals, you, as the parents of your home, you name your sheep because you love them. Yes, amen. We love him. Yes, amen. Love amen. I love you, Lord, because you heard my voice. It's in the yes. message, but it's in my mind. Yes. We love him because he first loved me. I love you, Lord, because you heard my voice. Amen. And I love him because he first loved me, and he hears my voice, and now I hear his voice. Amen. He's yeah. my shepherd. Amen. He he knows my name. Amen. Hey, listen, don't he write down your name in the book of life? Amen. He's got each of your names written down. He can't lose track of you. Amen. Amen. He'll not forget. Amen. He calls them by name and leadeth them out. Hey, listen, if you love him, you'll lead them. As an under-shepherd of this church, I love you. Amen. I try to know your names, Kyle. <laughs> but if, I, but I, if I'm not leading you, it's because I don't love you. Amen. A shepherd who loves will lead. 
Husbands, this ain't even in the notes. Now, husbands, love your wives. If a husband loves his wife, he'll lead them. I thank God He loves us. Amen. And He leads us. Yes. And as a good pastor should be, should desire to be, He should love His sheep and lead them. Yes. Amen. Uh, not, sheep are not always easily led. No. You know, the, you, know who the, you know you know who's easily led? This kind of bleeds into the last point. You know who's easily led? Blind and deaf sheep. Yeah. Blind and deaf people are easily led. Yeah. Yeah. Now listen, there's two parts to that. The Bible's a what? Double-edged sword? Yeah. Two-edged sword? Yeah. If, if blind and deaf sheep are easily led, then that means you can be easily led by the stranger. Yeah. Yeah. A, a deaf sheep can't hear the voice of the... So they'll just do like what uh, Isaac did for his son uh, Jacob, putting on the garments because he lost his sight. He goes off a feeling. It feels like my master, without hearing him or seeing him, I'll just follow. But listen, as I take, gave you in Sunday school, we should also desire to be blind and deaf. And let God lead us. Yeah, right. And not say, I know better. Yeah. <laughs> but sheep are not always easily led because sheep oftentimes think they know better than God. Yeah. Yeah. So what we need to be is blind and deaf sheep yeah. when it comes to the will of God say, Lord, lead me. And when it comes to doctrine and rightly dividing and trying the spirits, we need to have a keen sense about us lest we be led by our feelings and easily led by the stranger. Yeah. In the stranger's voice. Without turning to all the places, because I've used up a lot of you know non-textual things here or, or, or uh, sermon notes here. You know, God's voice was in the garden. Genesis chapter three, verse eight. They heard His voice walking in the garden. You know, His voice. The Bible says was on the cross. Luke twenty-three forty-six. Luke twenty-three forty-six says this. It says, um, and when Jesus cried with a loud voice. He said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Mm. Having said this, he gave up the ghost. His voice was there in the garden. His voice was in the garden of Gethsemane when he cried, not my will, but thy will be done. Mm. And the garden of Gethsemane is connected to that garden of, Cal of Calvary there when he lifted up his voice and said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. What am I saying? I'm saying God's voice is all throughout Genesis to Revelation. Because you know what, I, you know what I, I was reading about? In, uh, in Revelation 22, his voice closes out the Bible as a shepherd to his sheep. You ready? As a good shepherd would close out. He's leading them, right? Mm -hmm. He's not going to just stop talking to them when the Bible closes. So the Bible closes with the voice of the shepherd and the voice of the sheep in dialogue. You ready? Mm -hmm. The shepherd says, surely I come quickly. And you know what the sheep say? Bah, bah. What is that? Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Amen. The shepherd is telling the sheep, as a shepherd, I'm going to lead you out of here very soon. I'm coming quickly. And you know what the sheep's response to that is? It's not, let us stay down here a little bit longer. Hey, let us be, let us be fed as, as sheep to the slaughter. Hey, let us clothe somebody else just so they can spill, you know, a red paint on it for Peter's sake. No, you know what they're saying? They're saying, even so come, Lord Jesus. Right. And you know what? As we know God's coming, you know what we're supposed to reply as bleeding sheep and lowing oxen? Even so come, Lord Jesus. That's a dialogue. Yeah. And in the, um, in, the, in the quotes there, this is what I had. Prayer is not a monologue but a dialogue. God's voice is its most essential part. Listening to God's voice is the secret of the assurance that he will listen to mine. Andrew Murray. Husbands, if you want her to listen to your voice, be willing to listen to hers. A marriage is not a monologue. It's a marriage of two parties, both listening to each other's voice. Amen? Amen. But ladies, the most important voice in that is the voice of the husband. The most essential part is listening to God's voice. Because yeah. the husband's supposed to lead. The pastor's supposed to lead. The Lord's supposed to lead. Amen? Amen. A dialogue. This can never be a church where it's the Nicolaitan type church where it's just ex cathedra. I speak without any error whatsoever. You know that ain't true. Yeah. Yeah. But, but how about you give yourself that same humility? Yeah. Yeah. Amen? And it's a dialogue there. Yeah. Lastly, the voice of the stranger. This is your adversary. Your adversary. The sheep was you. The shepherd was your savior. The Bible says in Hebrews 3.15, 3, while it is said today, if you will hear his voice, 
harden not your hearts as in the provocation. When the sheep's voice, or when, when, the, uh, when the sheep's heart becomes hardened to the voice of the shepherd, they become blind and deaf and dumb, spiritually speaking. So now they're easily led astray by the voice of the stranger. Mm. The voice of the stranger is not there for your good. The voice of the stranger is your adversary. He is likened here, the Bible says, the, the one that comes up another way, the same as a thief and a robber. And we believe in the Second Amendment here. We don't want no thieves and no robbers coming into our homes, right? So if that's true physically about our possessions, why is it not true for us spiritually? Why do we not shield ourselves and guard ourselves and equip ourselves and arm ourselves with the weapons of God to defend ourselves against the thief and the robber that is to destroy and steal you of your joy and of your Christianity and of your sound doctrine? He's also called later on in the chapter... He's called a hireling two times in the same chapter. And he's also called a wolf two times in the chapter. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant. For your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And you know the ones that he devours are the ones who are not being led. But the ones who say, I know the way to go. I know the better way. You're distracted, you're deceived, and not too long before you're destroyed by your adversary, the devil. Do we have a pattern for that? God said, in the, it says in the beginning, God said, let there be light. Two chapters later, Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, the voice of the stranger shows up. There was a stranger in the garden that day. God was there, the angels were there, Adam and Eve were there. But a stranger showed up with a stranger's voice. And he says, Yea, have God said, Thou shalt not surely die. Yeah. For God doth know that the, days, that the day thou eatest thereof, you'll be as gods, knowing between good and evil. She was deceived. The Bible says she was deceived in that, uh, in that event there, in that dialogue that she had. She was deceived. That's why the voice of God in a dialogue is much more important than your voice yes, or exactly. the stranger's voice. Yes. Ladies, that's why the voice of your husband is much more important than some other husband or some other woman or what you watch Joyce Meyer say or what somebody else said. Listen, your husband's supposed to be leading the home. Yes. Amen. Yes. You ladies that are widows or single, it's harder for you. The devil's after you because he knows you don't have a head in the home. Your head is the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. Mm -hmm. And as it branches beyond that, and I, I'm not going to run with this, you, you want to go to your pastor and say, Pastor, what, is, what does this say about, what does the Bible say about this? Because He's supposed to be sort of that guiding figurehead of your home. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a line that you can't cross on that kind of thing. We understand that. But the devil's after you. Mm -hmm. You'll see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, mm -hmm. verse 3 and verses 13 through 15. He goes after the weaker vessel. Remember, the weaker vessel carries the more important cargo, right. mm -hmm. as you heard about in the sermon this week. Mm -hmm. The subtle voice has appeared throughout human and church history by the mouth of the unsaved, the religious, the hypocrite, the backslidden in heart, Hollywood, the government, and the press. There's so many voices in the world. Mm -hmm. Love not the world. These are the things that are in the world. Why? Because Satan's voice is... He's called the God of this world. I know I'm going late. Just bear with me for a second. The Satan is called the God of this world. At 1 Corinthians 14 verse 7 said, There are so many kinds of voices in the world, and all of them are not without signification. There are so many voices. You have to try the spirits behind those voices. I think there are probably more voices for the stranger than for the Savior. Because the Bible says, And many shall go in their act. Wide is the gate, broad is the way, and wide is the gate, and many there go in there. But few narrows the way, straight is the gate, and very few that find it and go in. In other words, on the broad path of the world and the strangers and the voices, there's a lot more to deceive than there are to help you. Amen. It's why you must be willing to be led right. by the shepherd. Amen. Walk in the spirit, you'll not obey the lust of the flesh. Amen. You have the voice of the unsaved, the religious. That's what we were talking about. If he's, if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. Amen. You pious jackass. Yeah. <laughs> you ever slipped up? Yeah. Well, then he wasn't Lord of all in that moment. Amen? Amen. 
Hey, listen, there's areas in your life he ain't the Lord of all. Don't deceive yourself. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Right. And the truth is not in us. Right. He's the Lord of all because he's the Lord that saved me. Amen. I'm this you with his pastor. Of course he's my Lord. Amen. And I don't bat a thousand. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Bible says no man can call him Lord unless by the Holy Ghost in Corinthians chapter 13 there. 2 Corinthians 13. Of course you have Hollywood deceiving our children, mm -hmm. our daughters, our sons. Amen. They're just so easily deceived, so easily led because they're blind. Yeah. They're dumb. They're dumb sheep. They're deaf sheep. They're blind sheep. They don't see the devilment, the beguilement within Hollywood. And then the government, we're only here to help. Yeah. And then the press. Oh, boy. I was thinking about this. You know what the, you know what the press creates? Chaos. It's easier than that. Pressure. Yeah. Pressure. It's the key word, and the word pressure is press. The press pressures you to conform and to compromise. Yeah. Yeah. To make you feel bad about being one of God's sheep. Yeah. Well, listen, you're always going to be his sheep. Amen. You can dress up like a like a goat, mm -hmm. but underneath all that facade, hypocrisy, you're still one of God's sheep. Amen. Can I just say this? There's another voice that'll trip you up that I think the devil will use. It's your own voice. The Bible says, fiery darts of the wicked. It attacks the mind. It attacks the heart. It attacks the will. It attacks the spirit. You'll have voices in your head. You'll hear voices in your mind. Why are they there? And, and a lot of it is picked up. Those voices are magnified or manifested because of Hollywood, the government, the press, unsaved family members, and outside sources, unbiblical scholars and theologians, those outside voices all go to a, a voice that is inside of you. And that voice in you, as you listen to that voice out there, it begins to cast doubt. Your own voice begins to distract you. Your own voice begins to discourage you. You'll say, you'll be trying to read your Bible, but you're so distracted by the many voices that is corrupted. He says, lest your minds be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. So many voices of all the know-it-alls and the so-be-it-alls and all of the theologians, the scholars, and all the professionals, and all the self-help, and all the gurus, they're all trying to impress upon you a way to think that is an unbiblical, unsound way to think, and it so twists and corrupts your mind that the simplicity of the Bible no longer becomes clear. And all that just goes to discourage you. That's right. And then, then, that's what I wrote down, a deaf and blind man is easily led. Mm. See, I want to resist that voice, those strangers' voice, and then the arsenal that he has. How do I do that? Well, without turning there in Ephesians 6, you can only resist and defeat the voice by trying the spirits, 1 John 4, 1, try the spirits, whether they be of God. Uh, believe, beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets' voices are gone out into the world. Yeah. That's why he gives you in Ephesians 6, the shield of faith, the, yeah. the, the breastplate of righteousness, yeah. the feet shod, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and the others there. You can only resist and defeat this voice by trying the spirits through the Holy Spirit and heeding to the voice of God in the written Word of God. God's voice. Can I just say this? God's voice showed up first. Oh, amen. <laughs> yeah. Whoever showed up first is... The one who started the whole thing. Amen. And God's voice showed up first. So this is the voice in the word of God. The voice of the word of God. The voice of the spirit of God. In the word of God. Is how we try the spirits. That are all. All the voices. All the all the ideas. All the theologies. All the heresies. We were talking before church this morning. How do I know this? And how do I know that? It's good you ask your pastor. But can I tell you. You have the sword of the spirit in your hand. Amen. Go to the shepherd's voice. Record in his word and believe it. Amen. Yep. Amen. Let me close with this. Go to 2 Kings. You can leave John. Go to 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 31. And I really appreciate the extra time you're giving me. I know I'm not a two-hour preacher, amen. <laughs> you know how hard it is to edit a two-hour sermon? 
<laughs> but if you could just bear with me for just a couple more minutes. I wanted to show you this. I believe God had me read, reading where I was reading just based on where we are, John. Look at 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 31. This is the woman who lost her son. She's the woman of Shunem. God gave her a son. She didn't even want the son, you know, in the sense that she didn't ask for it. Uh, uh, the servant of, uh, I think it's Gehazi, said, you know, well, Lord, she, or Master, she ain't got a son. If God would give her a son, that might be something that she could uh, be blessed by. And she said, you know, don't deceive me and all that kind of stuff there. Well, that child dies. That son dies. And, uh, and Elisha wants to raise up that son from the dead, so he sells, sends Gehazi to go do it. But Gehazi can't get the job done. And so Elisha comes and saves the day. But look at 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 31. And Gehazi passed on before them and laid the staff upon the face of the child. But there was neither voice nor hearing. Wherefore he went again to meet him and told him, saying, The child is not awake. Can I just say this? If you can't hear the voice of the shepherd, and if the shepherd can't hear your voice, you know what you are? You're dead. You're dead. Spiritually, you're dead. Just like this young boy here. He could not hear the voice of Gehazi. And Gehazi could not hear his voice because he was not awake. He was sleeping. And the word for sleeping in the Bible is obviously death. Most likely, Christians are spiritually dead. You know why? Because they listen to the voice of the stranger rather than the voice of the shepherd. Well, what do you need to be awakened? We need a power greater than Gehazi. <laughs> Amen. Elisha comes in and finishes the job, amen. Lays on him. I think he's, he, he lays on him, stretches out his hand. I can't imagine the scene there. He must have overlapped him. Either that's a big boy and, or, or Elisha's a short dude like me. And he's spread out over him just like that face-to-face, mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. Just as I believe God was on Adam in the garden. The Bible says that God breathed into Adam the breath of life. That's a picture of Elisha here laying on Gehazi, spread out just like that, face on the ground, palms down, right? And then, of course, the boy wakes, wakes up. You know what I thought about? Lazarus come forth. Lazarus was dead. And a lot of Christians are spiritually dead. And the only way you're going to be awakened is not my voice, it's not his voice, or any of your voices in here. If you're going to be awakened to what God wants you to do, how God wants you to live, how God wants to go about the rest of your life, whether you ever come back to this church or not, however God wants you to live the rest of your life, the only way you're going to know and the only way you're going to be awakened to what you're supposed to do is God's voice. That's right. You need a voice much greater than mine and even Elisha's own voice. You need the voice of God who can say, Lazarus, come forth. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. And we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we do thank you today for your voice. Thank you, Lord, for the.